Hello, and welcome to another episode of Instant Impact with Elise Archer. I am your host, Elise Archer, and this is a really fun and special and a little bit of a different episode as well. So um, part of why this is fun for me is that as I record this intro, I am currently in Venice, Italy, and um, just coming off a couple of days with uh, just the incredible, incredible female business owners in the coaching program that I'm participating in this year. And man, there's nothing like getting in a new culture, getting in a new environment, um, you know, investing in yourself to really expedite the growth process. And literally in two days, my entire business plan and model has been reworked. I have huge goals for uh, the last part of 2019 and going into 2020 that I hadn't even thought about doing for maybe two to three years. And now we've set a timeline on them for March and, and I can see how it's possible. And so what's exciting about this is getting in a new environment and traveling to a new location. I don't know when the last time was for you that you went to a different country. Maybe you do that a lot. Maybe you never have, but there is so much richness that comes from being in a new place and exposing yourself to new people, new language, new traditions, just make you think differently about your life and your business and how you're running it. And with that, you know, kind of in the line of thinking differently, I wanted to share something a little bit unique on the podcast today. And I do a lot of podcast interviews um, not just as the as the host, as all of you know me, but also as a guest. And I usually don't share them here in my podcast, and I'll try to link them in my social media as they happen. But this one in particular, I actually wanted to bring to you and share with you. And it's an interview I did several weeks ago with Talia Del Jew of the Sincerely Me podcast. It's a podcast that's been featured in Forbes about how to build deeper relationship with yourself and doing more of the inner work so that you can show up more fully and powerfully in the world. And you know, part of why I wanted to share this interview with you is um, the title of it is Evolving Through Adversity. And I think so often we look at the people we follow online and we think they've got it all figured out. And you, you and I both know this isn't true, right? But there's often a piece of us that looks at the perfect Instagram feed or looks at how they're doing their live videos and has us say, okay, they really are living the perfect life. They've got it figured out. And so much of my own personal story, um, you know, I look at people online and I have that little piece of me that sometimes thinks that too. And then I, I, what I remember is even in my own story, how much adversity I personally have gone through and evolved through and how those people I'm following have as well, even if we don't see it. And so why I love this interview with Talia is that we go back into how I've evolved through some pretty massive challenges um, in my personal life, in my professional life over the past decade. And I've shared some of it publicly and then some of it I haven't really shared publicly before. And I wanted to share this with you just so that you get a little bit of a behind the scenes and also hopefully massive encouragement if you personally are going through any sort of personal or professional upheaval right now, you know, the whole process of growing a brand and becoming more visible and going after what we want, it is, it, it's filled with highs and lows. And so often we only talk about the highs, um, but I think that the lows are the things that really shape and mold us into who we are. And as I look back on my journey, I can see how each and every challenge was shaping me and positioning me to take on my next level. And the very same thing is happening for you too. And um, I just, I love this interview. Talia is a phenomenal interviewer. Um, I would recommend, in addition to listening to this episode, go check her out online. Um, I'll link everything in the show notes so you can go see her and see her website, but her social media is incredible. Her podcast is incredible. She's a speaker, she's a coach, and um, just has the most amazing heart. But we really go deep in this episode, and I'm excited to share it with you and hopefully encourage you um, so that you know you're not in this journey alone, and I'm here with you, and um, all of us are here together, going through it together, right? So um, super excited to share this with you, and let's go ahead and dive into my interview with Talia. Welcome to Sincerely Me, a podcast about self-discovery and inner work so you can cultivate a deeper relationship to yourself and show up more fully in your work and life. 
My name is Talia Delju, and I'm honored to be your host. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. This episode, I, I say this every episode, I know, but this episode is if anyone that you know is like, oh, I'm looking for a new podcast, uh, do you have any recommendations? And of course, you say, yeah, sincerely me. This is the episode to start with. We talk about so much good stuff in this episode. And as you know, the title is Evolving Through Adversity. But goodness, Elise and I talk about really what it's like to reinvent yourself and untangle yourself from all the things you thought you were supposed to be and how she used adversity as an opportunity to evolve and grow on her own path. And it's really for the folks who realize like, man, where I'm at is not really where I want to be right now, even if it's what I've worked towards for the past however many months or years. So we talk about the process of peeling back those layers, learning to be alone with yourself, and really taking back control of your life through the choices you decide to make and how in the process you really do uncover who you are. So all of that to say, lots in store for this episode, and before I kick off with Elise's bio and the episode, I do want to ask you guys for some help. So as you know, this podcast has been around for a few months, and we are about to reach 10 thousand downloads, which is so exciting. And in order to really help the podcast grow and get to more people, the power is in your hands. By subscribing, rating, and reviewing, you help more people find this podcast. It gets more visibility, and it also makes me feel great. So... <laughs> Please, if you've been enjoying this podcast, if you love these episodes, if any of them super resonated with you, please drop a note, leave a comment, write a review. It means the whole world. Okay, so to Miss Elise Archer. Elise is an entrepreneur and personal brand strategist who helps people stand out with confidence be more visible, and attract their dream clients. She's super passionate about helping people make a super big impact and build a more influential reputation through lots of things. She does brand strategy coaching. She has an awesome blog and her own podcast called Instant Impact. I, for one, have had the pleasure of working with Elise one-on-one -on, -one on parts of my brand myself and have seen the impact of her work on my business starting literally at day one. So this episode is for anyone who, man, this episode is for everyone, <laughs> um, for anyone who is maybe going through a difficult time through some adversity and is ready to move through it with a little bit more faith, uh, for anyone who is ready to listen to that inner voice that's pushing for change for anyone who just doesn't feel like the path they're on is aligned with who they want to become in their lives moving forward and for everyone else in the world <laughs> so without further ado here is my conversation with elise archer hi elise welcome to the podcast Hi, Talia. Welcome. Well, I guess welcome to you. Welcome to me. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. There you go. I'm usually the interviewer, so it feels different to be interviewed. So totally. it's fun to, uh, to do this. Well, as I mentioned to you, we're going to, as I do on most of my podcasts, jump right in and talk about an experience you shared with me when we connected about being on a podcast and you, you shared a story about how a lot of your life has been spent or not a lot of your life, but you've reached certain points in life where you've had to reinvent yourself and in your own words, untangle yourself from the things you thought you were supposed to be. Mm -hmm. That is so powerful and will undoubtedly be the foundation for the rest of this conversation because there's so much there. And I would love to talk about the process of reinvention and, and untangling and how to make the changes when you realize where you're at is not where you want to be anymore, even though it's what you've worked towards for 
months, if not years. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's funny because it's not a topic I would have seen myself talking about a lot, even up until maybe a year ago. But so much of my life has transformed, even in the past 12 months, that um, I think there's a lot of value I can add here. So I'll kind of take a step back and then I'll, I'll speak to the most recent reinvention I went through. Sure. Um, but so much of my life, you know, starting with my childhood and early teen years was really spent um, trying to be the person that I thought specifically my family needed me to be. So I grew up in a household of very high achieving parents. Um, they were both extremely you know, successful academically and one of the things that I always felt in our household was this, an underlying tension between them. So they were kind of the parents where um, there was never overt fighting, but there was always a lot of underlying tension. And I always wanted to fix that in our household. And so I spent so much of my childhood um, trying to kind of keep the peace and make people laugh and make people happy. And I should say too, I love both of my parents dearly. Like they're my dearest friends to this day. And I think each of us, uh, I believe each of us kind of chooses our parents before we come down to this earth because we are meant to learn the lessons that we learn in our families. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very cognizant of that, but I do remember just always feeling like um, it was on me to hold the family together and, to make everyone happy, specifically my mom. And in my teen years, I developed a pretty severe eating disorder and I was anorexic and I got down to like, for some context, I'm like, I have no issue sharing. I'm like 135 now. And I was, I think I was like 87 pounds, oh, wow. um, same height. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was at the point of almost being hospitalized because I remember thinking that um, the way for people to like me was to be thinner. I remember going on a family trip to Europe in my teens, and I'd always been a little bit pudgier than my younger sister. And I lost some weight and we got back. And I remember my dad started giving me compliments that I looked good. And I'd always wanted his attention. And he had always been very, um, a lot of listeners may be able to relate to this. Like he'd always just been very focused on work and not necessarily emotionally available. And I, I was like, oh, this is how I can get him to like me. This is how I can get attention. And so I started just this, it ended up being sadly a 17 year cycle of eating disorder from everything from anorexia to binge eating. And so that really um, was kind of, it, it was something that through my twenties wasn't necessarily visible on the outside, but it's something I was still struggling with. Mm -hmm. And I channeled a lot of that anxiety um, into proving myself at work. So from my early 20s, I decided to go to work and go into sales because I knew I could earn a lot of money and I would never have to depend on a man to take care of me and blah, blah, blah. So early 20s, I was earning six figures. I had a house. Um, I, you know, on the outside, I, I looked like I had everything I wanted or everything someone could want, right? I think we kind of often we go after these um perceived status symbols that make it look like to the outside that we've got it together. Yeah. And I really went all in on building that image and that perception. And I was able to fool everybody else but myself. And I found myself um, in my mid twenties married to an alcoholic, um, you know, again, making good money, but on the inside, just feeling totally empty, still struggling kind of undercover with this eating disorder and that was actually really the the first place where I had to untangle um, was getting to my lowest point where I just remember looking up one morning and thinking, I am so unhappy with who I am at this point. And I had built this outer wall of, um, of things and of stuff and of image and of looking a certain way that I thought would make other people like me. And I was so sad. And so that started this long process of uh, this unraveling, right? A kind of untangling, mm -hmm. I think, over our lives, over the course of our lives from the time we're born up until kind of our um, whatever that quote unquote breaking point is that some of us reach when we've been going after these things. I almost think about us like an, an onion where it's like we're just adding on layers and adding on layers. And then we reach this point where we've got all these layers around us and we're lost somewhere deep inside. Mm -hmm. And the task is then to start 
peeling back the onion, right? And unpeeling the layers. So um, I, I got a divorce. I, um, you know, I made a lot of changes in my lifestyle. And I, that was the first point at which I started really, I would say, reconnecting with my faith mm-hmm. and um, starting to, to listen. I remember during a lot of that process, I hated being by myself. Like when I was before I before I got the divorce, before I started kind of detaching from all the things that I thought I needed to be, I would hate the quiet. I hated car rides by myself because I would have to hear my own voice in my head telling me that I wasn't in the right position, the right situation. And it was so painful that I would I start, actually started listening to podcasts because I just wanted to drown out the noise. <laughs> I started to really actually discover personal development and the concept that I could um, take control of my life and that everything in my life was a direct result of who I was and choices I was making. And I've never been exposed to personal development before. It just wasn't something that was part of our family. And it really started to transform my life. And so that was, I would say maybe, um, phase one of the detangling process. And that was, that really started around age 27. And then I went through, a, um, a five-year period of rebuilding and having um, a, just a much different experience of life where I actually, I met a new man who's my husband now, who's absolutely incredible, like so much more a reflection of who I feel like I truly am at my core. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I started doing more uh, charitable work. I, I started getting more involved in the community. Like I, I really started to feel like I was more of myself. And along that way, and this kind of leads up to what the second more recent untangling was, I um, became a partner in this international sales coaching organization. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I got to do one-on-one work with business owners and sales professionals every day. I got to help them um, accomplish their goals I made great money. I had, you know, time freedom. I had a team that I was building of just incredible, um, amazing other sales coaches. And it was like, it was my dream. And I thought I would always be there and life felt really good. And then a little over a year ago from the time at which we're recording this, um, there were some really sudden and unexpected changes in the company. And just due to legal stuff, I can't really get into it. But what I can say is that All of a sudden, I was faced with this really, really hard decision where the person that I was no longer felt aligned with what the company had become in my mind. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I was suddenly faced with this choice of I can stay and I can keep doing what I'm doing or I can go and I have no idea what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. And I, I spent a month struggling with that decision. And actually, my whole body broke out into hives. Um, I had just recruited a team member who left a, a job that paid her over $300,000 a year to come work with us on straight commission. And I felt so responsible for her success. Mm-hmm. And I remember just wrestling with, oh, my God, like, I am so responsible for my team's livelihood, for my client's well-being like I've you know I've I've told people that um, they can have whatever they want by by partnering with me here and all of a sudden I felt like I couldn't fulfill on that any longer and it was a long month of struggling and a lot of tears and a lot of um, just pain and I finally reached the point where I realized I could no longer be the best version of myself by staying Mm-hmm. And so I, I had to make the choice to leave and it was messy and it was painful. And I think anytime we make a big leap or a big untangling, we have to know that it's not necessarily going to be pretty in the moment. And it was about six months of messiness and pain and detangling and guilt and all of the emotions that come from feeling like you're letting people down. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I will say taking a stand and having faith that if you are feeling called to do something different than what you're doing right now, that you're being called for a reason and that it's not, um, that if you, if you take action in that direction, that you're going to be supported. That was really what got me through. And it's been incredible what's happened in my life just in the past year since making that transition. And I'm happy to, to speak to that at some point if it's helpful. But what I can say is now on the backside of it. I wouldn't change a thing. 
And it's taught me so much about what's important and um, who I am and, and what I want my life to be about as well. So I know that was really like a long story, but happy to kind of take that <laughs> wherever you would like it to go um, next. Oh my goodness. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. That is such a powerful story to tell. And I think, I mean, one of the things I love most about being a part of a podcast is that it allows people to share their stories and we need more opportunities to share our stories because that's where we really, A, realize how much we ourselves have grown, but B, are able to teach and learn and and share and share our life, our messages, you know, and, mm-hmm. and there's so much from that one story that I'm, without a doubt, I know so many people listening can relate to or resonate with and they're just like, I'm taking notes like a mad woman over here. Like, okay, let's talk about this and let's talk <laughs> about that. Because you hit on a lot of points. The first one, the first one being the importance of knowing when it's time. So I do want to talk a little bit more about like when it's when it's time for change. Mm. And also accepting that in the in-between, it's going to be messy, but that doesn't mean it was the wrong decision. Mm-hmm. And some other things I'll throw out and we can kind of pick whatever we want to keep talking about is the the tendency most of us have to ignore that inner voice when we might know deep down it's time for change and we might know deep down what I'm doing is no longer aligned. A lot of us tend to ignore it. We tend to drown it out, justify to ourselves why we should stay, why we should be happy because on the surface we've checked all the boxes and 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 we really do start living for other people. The guilt keeps the narrative stuck to what is going to be best for others, not what's going to be best for ourselves. And so that, yeah, I mean, there's so much here. So let's, let's go with timing and when, when you actually know it's time to make a change and when sitting in that discomfort just gets to be unbearable. Yeah. Well, I I think it's, you know, this is probably one of the biggest lessons we all learn in our lives is to listen to that voice, because I think the more in tune we can be, and, and oftentimes that just comes from, you know, a daily meditation practice and having solitude, whether it's going in the woods on a regular basis and just hiking by yourself or being by yourself or just creating space for silence um, the more in tune we can be with that voice that tells us, and then we can take action when we get the little nudges versus like the giant pushes off of a cliff. Mm-hmm. And so that's something that I, uh, I'm i always working on is listening for that voice so that I don't have to get a major wake up call before I create a change. And so I think sometimes life gives us those major wake up calls when we've been getting signs all along and we just haven't listened. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think one thing that has really helped is to learn to listen to my body. And for anyone who has had an eating disorder, unfortunately, one of the things that happens is you become so out of tune with your body because you just, you you basically learn how to ignore uh, the signals, whether it's trying to tell you that it's hungry or that it's full, you disassociate from that. And so it can be a big learning curve to get back to listening to your body Mm -hmm. because it'll always tell you the answers. But one of the things that I think anyone can do is start to look for, you know, if you're feeling maybe like a little nudge that, hey, I think it's time for a change. Like your body will tell you things physically. Um, And oftentimes, you know, illness or physical symptoms, kind of like the hives I broke out in on my whole body. It was simply these unexpressed emotions that had to come out. And by the time something manifests physically in our body, a lot of times we've been ignoring it for a while. And that was certainly the case with me, but if, if you're having these physical symptoms, oftentimes it is an indication that there is something that you are not taking action on. Mm-hmm. There is something that you're repressing. There is something that you're being called to do when you know it and you haven't done it. And your body has to get your attention somehow and the energy has to come out somehow. So it often comes out physically. But the other thing that, that we can do is kind of, and I learned this from Marie Forleo and I love this. It's been so helpful is when I'm weighing two decisions um, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll find myself a quiet spot to really get present with both of those decisions. And I'll, I'll start visualizing the first and feeling what would it look like to take action on this first decision and go down this first path. And I really just try to be present with it. 
And what I'm feeling for is, do I feel an expansion or a contraction in my body? Mm -hmm. And if I feel an expansion, that means it's the right way to go. If I feel a contraction, that means it's the wrong way to go. I do that with both. And you'll, again, it's, if you're in tune enough with your body, you'll feel which one is the better choice for you. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a matter of saying, okay, I trust that that's the right path. And a lot of times the right path is the one that seems scarier because it's the one that's going to ask you to go to a new level and to become a new person and to make these scary choices. But ultimately it is the thing that is going to expand you as a human being, as a consciousness. And that's so powerful. And that's really what life is about. So that's one of my favorite tools that I, I like to use and try to use before it gets to the point of physical illness or sickness um, showing up in my body like, hey, you got to do something <laughs> about this. Yeah, learning how to listen and and to trust what you're hearing too. Mm, and again, to yeah. not find, because our, our minds are quick to find all the reasons and excuses to not do the thing we know is best, know is right for ourselves. And it reminds me of one of my favorite books. It's called The Crossroads of Should and Must by El Luna. And I'm going to read one of the quotes on, on her pages in the book. And it says, there are two paths in life, should and must. We arrive at this crossroads over and over again. And every day we get to choose. And I love this because, I mean, that, that to me is where we catch ourselves all the time. What I should do according to everyone else, according to what seems smart or seems right or seems logical versus what I must do because I'm feeling called to do by something greater. Mm. And the opportunity that every day presents itself to choose differently, every opportunity, every moment in life, you have the power to choose differently. Are you mm. choosing what you should do? Or are you choosing what you must do? Are you choosing perfection? or Are you choosing authenticity? And and how cool is it that we get we get to choose that? And if it's not today, it'll it'll present itself again tomorrow. And and I think it's such a powerful reminder this this aspect of choice and how we forget that we have the power to choose sometimes, and we fall victim to whatever the circumstance is, and we feel like we just have to stick to it because of whatever reasons our mind makes up, and and we we take a back seat. I love that. And I think you just said, if I can just add a thought there, um, I think you just said something so important. And I've never heard it presented that way, but the kind of the dichotomy between should and must. And it reminds me of a conversation I was having with my coach a couple months back where I had a certain revenue goal for the month and I didn't hit it. And she took a look at all my numbers and she took a look at um, what my, like, what the goals were that I was accomplishing that month. And she looked at it and she was like, at least this just wasn't a must for you. She was like, you were fine not hitting this goal. Mm -hmm. And it really, and she said, the only, when things happen is when you make them a must for you. Yeah. And that is the only time when things will happen mm -hmm. is when they become a must. Yeah. And I think sometimes we can get so buried under the shoulds, like you talked about, if I should be this or I should be that, that we never take the time to really get clear on, well, what is actually a must for me? Mm -hmm. And it's such a more powerful place to be operating from. So I love that. I'm going to check out that book. I've actually never heard of that, but yes. I think you know, that quote is an indication of how great it is. Yeah. It's going to be a good read. So great. It's beautifully illustrated. It's a lot of images and paintings and mm -hmm. um, just like creative artistic expressions with these super powerful quotes. And I recommend it to a lot of coaching clients I work with. And it's, it's something that's so necessary to turn back to every few months as just that gentle reminder. And yeah, I'll link it in the show notes for anyone who wants to check it out. Something else that brings up for me that you also shared with me beforehand was how the process of making that decision and making that choice, that's the part that can be messy. That's the part that feels the most uncomfortable, but that's the that's the part of the process that we're being asked to sit in, right? Like that discomfort and that, mm. that shedding, that peeling back of these layers that have created armor and that make us feel strong and protected and safe. And, and how it's in that process that you're actually able to draw closer and deeper into yourself. That's, that's where the getting to know yourself really takes place. And in today's day and age of immediacy and social media and how fast we're able to get our hands on things, 
it's, it's so counter to that culture of quick and fast and easy. And it takes time. It takes patience. It takes self-compassion. And those are the parts of life that we want to skip over because they are uncomfortable. But the longer we ignore them and the quicker we go through them without pulling out the lessons that are meant for us in those experiences, the more frequently and louder those, those universal like knocks on the door will be and it'll keep showing up and keep showing up and keep showing up louder and louder and louder until you decide, okay, there's something here that I need to listen to. There's some time that I need to be spending here. There's something there's something for me here at a deeper level that I've yet to pull out and connect to. And again, that's where the real work, in my opinion, takes mm. place. Totally agree. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's, you know, we set ourselves up for failure if we expect it to always be really good and really easy. Um, not to say that yeah. there's not always good in everything, because I believe there is. But the way that we evolve and grow into that next um, the next level of ourselves is through, it's through pain, you know, and there's this, this great um, analogy of how lobsters, um, when they reach, you know, they, they, ha I, gosh, I don't know the full story. So please excuse me if, if someone's listening and they know like the full anatomy of the lobster, <laughs> but you, you can Google it. <laughs> but so, so the, the high level idea is that you know, a lobster at a certain point, its soft body gets too big for its hard outer shell. And it has two choices at that point. One is to stop growing inside in order to fit within the shell. Or the second is to go and actually go through this very painful shedding process where it goes into this group of rocks and it basically rubs its shell off for several days. And it's painful and it's torturous and it feels terrible, right? But through that process, it's able to release this restrictive shell that used to keep it safe and create space for this new bigger one to grow. And to me, there's so much truth just in the way that nature operates that we can learn from as humans. And like we are designed to go through that same process. And every single time we do, there's so much opportunity yeah. to grow into the next version of whoever we are, um, if we allow it to happen, right? If we are willing to say, hey, I know that pain is part of the process. And it, it makes me think of an, another book that one of my other coaches, um, Annalise Gentile, has written called From Chaos to Calm, Leading Change from the Inside Out. And she talks about kind of the, the dichotomy between chaos and calm and how chaos, which is really just the transition between two things, is needed in our lives and how new things are formed in that chaos and in that change. And if you think about it kind of like an earthquake where everything is shaken up and then it has to come back together, that's always where new, new things are formed, new things are built. And in the middle, it can feel scary. But if you can look to who am I becoming in this process and who am I being called to be? And what is the message? What is the good here in this? Um, like even if it's, you know, it's been a, another painful experience this year, but it's taught us so much. Um, my husband and I earlier this year found out we were pregnant with our first child and we're so excited. And I, I think I shared this with you, Talia, and we had about six weeks of being pregnant. And in that process, we went out and we bought a new house and I got so excited about being a mom. I actually didn't, I'd never really been clear on whether I wanted to be a mom or not. And I knew as soon as I found out that I was pregnant, that I wanted to be a mom. And then we lost the baby. And um, it was such a hard, it was really hard. It was probably the hardest thing I've ever been through in my life. Um, but what I learned through that process is I became so much stronger and I got so clear that I want to be a mom. And we moved into this insane, beautiful new house that we're in love with that has room for us to have a family. And we grew so much stronger in the process and I became more grounded and he really stepped up as a, as a man. And it's like, there's all these things that came from that, that have turned out to be so beautiful in our lives. Mm -hmm. Um, that you, you always have to know that when that pain yeah. is happening, there is something great waiting for you on the other side, just like the lobster shedding the shell, right? It's always leading to something great if you're available for it. 
And so I'm just really passionate about that because I, I know it's really hard in those moments of pain, but there's always something so beautiful on the other side. Yeah. And it's so, it's so, um, I guess typical is the word I'm searching for here for us to, in moments of pain and discomfort and transition to, to resist it and to make it 10 times harder than it has to be. Mm. Right. We're not here saying that like, you're not going to face hard things in life, but we tend to make them so much harder just by resisting and, and wanting things to not be the way they are in that moment and telling ourselves that they should be different. Again, I shouldn't be feeling this way, or, you know, I should be stronger. I should be able to handle this. I, I shouldn't have, you know, done the thing I did because then this wouldn't have happened or whatever other stories we make up in our minds. But it's such a powerful practice to be able to really stay present in whatever's going on, however hard, however uncomfortable and come at it with a little less resistance and more acceptance without the, without the judgment we attach to again, how it could have been, should have been, would have been, because that is just our ego and our minds making creating creating more of a um uphill battle to, mm-hmm. or you know it's, it's it's more it's steeper than it needs to be <laughs> oh my gosh yes 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 and you just reminded me of two other incredible books about those that those topics um one is the untethered soul and the other is mm-hmm. loving what is both of which have been I've, I've just read them recently and they've like really transformed a lot of my life but i think what you said is so important is when the only pain we experience really comes from resisting what is and us having a viewpoint that, well, like you said, this should be happening or shouldn't be happening, or this is unfair. And if we can learn to just accept, and even, you know, in that example of the miscarriage, it's like the longer I resisted that I was losing the baby, the more painful it was. And as soon as I accepted it and said, okay, this is what it is. It's happening. It is like, I accept it. Um, So much of the pain eased and Mm. that we create and we manufacture all this extra pain and extra drama um, that we don't really have to go through (laughs) if we just accept that things are happening for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not to say don't feel what's coming up, like absolutely feel what's coming up Mm -hmm. by pushing those emotions away. That's another form of resistance, in my opinion. Mm. So, you know, be open to what emotions come up and and sit with it, but don't define yourself by the experience because this is the, the cliche part of this episode is like, you know, that this too shall pass. It's temporary. These experiences as, as um, all encompassing as they feel and as forever as they may feel, it's being sure you have some kind of way or person or, you know, form of, perspective gathering and and being able to take a step back and whether you're in it or whether it's a month out to ask yourself okay what what can I pull from this what came from this and how can I move into this next season of my life with a little bit more um just like knowledge and trust and and self-assuredness that everything's everything is supporting you everything's working in my favor and even when it seems like the exact opposite is happening, there's, there's so much proof. If you were to look back at your experiences to help you believe that that's true today. Mm. Yes. Yeah. It's so true. We get caught up in, at least I'll speak for myself. Uh, Maybe, (laughs) maybe you can relate. Like I know I, sometimes I look at my own thoughts and I think, Oh my gosh, these thoughts are nuts. Like (laughs) I'll get caught up in this really fatalistic thinking about this thing is the end of the world or, you know, if such and such happens, it's going to be like, I'm going to be miserable for the rest of my life. And then you look back at everything that's happened in your life and realize actually everything has turned out, you know, really darn good. Or like, I can be grateful for everything that's happened. And, um, you know, some people may feel that perspective now, or maybe someone's listening and they're, they're not in that part of their journey right now. But I think my belief is ultimately each of us, um, can hopefully look back and say, you know what, it all turned out really good. I think if we can have that short term perspective as well with everything that's happening, it just makes stuff. It helps it pass faster. It helps it happen faster and it, it helps the whole experience be way more enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So what I want to do is try to make a turn here and talk a little bit about how 
a lot of your work is in helping people make an impact and have greater influence and kind of step into themselves and create, um, whether it's brands or businesses that really leave a legacy behind. Mm. Um, so let's talk about that and how, how making these choices and how reinventing yourself and untangling yourself and, and staying aligned with yourself and your truth is a part of leaving an impact and, and having that legacy. Yeah. So, you know, it, I love this question, Talia. It was so interesting last year when I exited my former company um, because I had spent many years and a lot of time and effort building up this reputation in the sales world. And I had even for the full year leading up to that done like a daily video, giving a sales tip and putting it up on social media. And so much of my, my ego really was tied up in being known in that space. And then when I exited the company, you know, part of my non-compete is, okay, I'm not, I can't build a brand in that space for a period of time. And I remember you know, it was this weird transition of going from feeling needed and having a lot of people commenting on my social media and getting a lot of inbound requests and um, feeling really like I was making an impact in my space to all of a sudden being silent and feeling unknown. And I had, I, I felt totally unsure of what I was going to talk about or what I was even going to be known for, for the next part of my life. That was part of just the, the way the transition happened. And I went through about a month of actually really struggling with that. And again, going from posting every day and being visible to suddenly feeling invisible. And it was very strange to feel like um, I had died in a way. And I was also at the same time, you know, starting to kind of get these nudges that I was meant to speak about a bigger conversation and speak about something bigger than the kind of the specific lane of sales. Um, but as I thought about the things that I would like to speak about, like generosity and making an impact and what life is really about, I felt very unqualified. And I felt it was kind of like, well, why me, right? Who am I to talk about these things? Mm -hmm. And it was uh, just about a month after I exited my company when my the co-host of a podcast uh, that I had been on for a couple of years passed away at age 39 in his sleep. And it was those two things combined back to back um, in a period of about a month that really shook me and kind of, I think, taught me how brief life can be. Mm -hmm. And the fact that every day that goes by that we don't show up in the way we're feeling called to show up or um, make that impact we're feeling called to make, it's, it's a sad waste, right? Or it can be. Um, and so I remember I was sitting, I was at the movie theater one day um, during this period. And I was, I was, again, just kind of like grappling with, well, what is my life going to be about from here? And what am I going to be known for? And how am I still going to help people? And I just felt like I got this download. It was like this total sudden clarity that there are so many other people who struggle with that same question. And part of why it feels really hard is that it can feel like we have to do something major in order for our lives to have meaning. And part of what I heard in that moment was that, yes, there is value in those major things, but there's also value in the really minor things, whether it's holding a door open for someone, giving a compliment, donating $5 to a charity you believe in. And the idea was born for this the um, kind of this, this brand and this idea of instant impact, which is that we can make an immediate impact by simply giving more of ourselves, by simply being more generous in what I wanted to do. For 10 minutes, just by doing a small, simple act of kindness for somebody else. And I created what I call the instant impact challenge, which is a 100 day challenge where every day it's like something small that you can do that creates a positive ripple effect in the world. And it really helped me through that time of transition just to feel like my life had purpose and meaning. Wow. Um, you know, it's, it's like <laughs> when you're brought to your knees, 
the smallest thing can make a difference. And it was, you know, I remember I bought, I think for the second day of the challenge, I uh, bought my mom and my stepdad, like some, this little model rocket that he could build. He loves that kind of thing. And I brought it over to them just as a surprise. And the look of joy on his face and how happy he was, that lit me up. And that made me feel like, okay, my life has meaning again, because I was able to positively impact somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so that was really where the concept of this whole instant impact brand that I've now really turned into my entire brand, which is more about how can we make a greater impact in less time? And a lot of what I incorporate into the work I do with professionals who are looking to build strong personal brands and be more visible is more about how can you get this, you know, better results in less time and overcome the insecurity that often shows up when we decide to show up and play a bigger game. And the underlying theme is it's generosity. It's simply giving more of yourself, being more generous with your message, with your time, uh, being more generous with yourself. You know, if you need to go take a walk, um, on a, you know, a Monday night to like clear your brain and give yourself the space to get clear on what's the message that I'm being called forth to share right now. Like do that. If you need to get coaching to give yourself the support to become the next level of yourself and make that next quantum leap, do that. So it's a message of generosity for ourselves and for others. And I really believe that generosity is a time bender. It shortens the time it takes to get results and for Mm -hmm. us to become the next level of ourselves. And it's just been such a a beautiful lesson in my life in the past year. And, uh, And I really hope it's something that people can apply to any place where they're struggling with insecurity or self-doubt. It's just, how can I be more generous in this situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And know that I have so much value to bring into my relationships, into my work, into whatever room I'm walking in. Yes. Yes, exactly. I love the saying, God makes no extra humans. (laughs) (laughs) and sometimes when we have these bigger conversations we can have those same fears like I had last year of who am I to speak about this and it's really we the very fact that you are a human on this earth having this experience is so exceptional and it is so rare and it is so unlikely that who are you not to speak about it Mm -hmm. you know there is someone out there who needs to hear it from you, specifically from you, not from anybody else, not from me, not from Talia, from you. Yeah. Um, and that, like just owning that is so empowering. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of people, when they're thinking about what they want to do, whether it's career-wise or building a business, they'll look at all the other people doing the same thing as a reason to not do it. Mm. And it's not that what you're offering is necessarily on paper that different, but how you offer it and who, who you are and what you bring from your own self and from your authentic kind of core, that's, what's going to distinguish whatever it is you're offering. Yes. And that's Mm -hmm. why, again, the work to get to know who you are and, and find the right expression of it through your work. That's, that's why it's so important because that's what people are going to connect with. It's you and your story and your why behind what you do. and. And know what, like, no one's ever lived your life experience. You're the mm-hmm. only one who knows that story. And the longer we live without telling those stories and, and finding ways to make more of an impact using them or being motivated by them, the, the longer we're sitting on gold mines. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yes. And it's it, that concept is really the foundation of one of my favorite quotes uh, from Larry Wingate. And he says, the key is to find your uniqueness and exploit it in the service of others. Mm -hmm. And that's like, that to me, what you just said, that hits the nail on the head spot on, because that's really the key is to, to first own and know that you do have a uniqueness and that you are uniquely you. And then, okay, what am I meant to do with this? And how can I use this to help other people? And I really think that's what life is about. It's pretty simple at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Takes time to get there, but that's when we get there. And also not to say that once we get there, we figured it all out, right? Like it's a constant evolution and transformation and the expression of it can continue to change, but it always brings us back to who we are and, and how who we are is here to serve other people. Yes. And that, that has been another big lesson over the past year of dropping the ego that I have arrived. 
<laughs> and knowing that there will be countless other iterations and that that's part of life and that's okay. And sometimes it's, it's helpful from a perspective standpoint to look at wherever you are right now and say, well, you know, what would my 60 year old self have to say about this or my 65 or my 70 or whatever it is. And, and what would she do? And what would she tell me to do? And who is she, you know, yeah. because she's probably evolved far beyond where mm -hmm. I am right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's ask her that question. If you, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to ask you this, but if you <laughs> go to any point in time and talk to Elise, what would you mm -hmm. say to her slash yourself? You know, the thing that shows up, Talia, is own your power. Mm -hmm. Just own it. Like so much of, I think the unnecessary struggle that I created that I've created in my life um, and the unnecessary amount of time it's taken to get things done has been from questioning my abilities and questioning, am I worthy of this message and questioning, well, am I sure that I'm right? And mm -hmm. really just owning it and say, and giving myself that same um, message that I would give to other people of you are here for a reason. Um, and what you are feeling called to do, there is a reason for it. So there's really no need to keep deliberating and questioning, should I do that Instagram live about this topic? Or should I reach out to that ideal client? Or should I write that book? It's like, no, own your power and go for it. That to me is what I, I've been thinking about this question a lot lately. Like, it's a really, really fun place to live yeah. and to just be willing to see what's on the other side of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing mm -hmm. that. Well, thank you. That was, you know, I hadn't thought about that question in a while. So <laughs> uh, so I'm glad you asked. <laughs> yes. And if that if that inspires anyone listening to write a letter to themselves in the true spirit of this podcast, feel free to do so. Feel free to share it with us. I always love getting the letters and sharing them on upcoming episodes. Mm. All right, Elise, tell everyone listening how they can check out your work, see more from you, hear more from you. You have an incredible podcast as well. So I'd love for you to share all of those links and contacts and goodies. Thank you. Yes. So I would so love to connect um, with you online. You can find me pretty much on any social media site, Elise Archer. It's E-L-Y-S-E. A-R-C-H-E-R. -E um, I'm on, I would say I'm on LinkedIn and Instagram the most, uh, but you can find me anywhere. And like Talia mentioned, I do have a podcast, um, which is about how do we make a greater impact um, in less time and become more visible in our space. And that's called Instant Impact with Elise Archer. And then I do have a fun um, free course that my team and I at Brand Builders Group have created that is all about how do you take that first step to more visibility in your space for anyone who's listening who wants to build a stronger personal brand. And um, it's called First Step to Famous, kind of a fun little title, but you can get it at ea.thebrandbuildersgroup.com. And it's a, a really powerful um, four-day video course that people love. And I think it should hopefully help people get some clarity on um, their uniqueness and how they can kind of step up into a higher level of visibility in their space. Um, but please do connect with me online. I just, um, I so value anyone who, um, you know, who listens to, to Tali and I know Tali, it's like your people are like you and you are such a gem and such a bright spot in the world. And I adore, like, I adore you. I adore connecting with people like you and, um, just really, really grateful for this opportunity. Yay! Well, that was my conversation with Elise. I hope you enjoyed it. If anyone in your circle, friend, family member came to mind as you were listening, please share this episode with them. I think there is just so much in here that will resonate with so many people. And the more who get access to this information, the less alone some of us might feel in our own journeys. So here is to evolving through adversity, reinventing yourself and untangling all the stories you have around who you should be and having the courage to write a new story and make a different choice. 
As always, you can find me on Instagram at Talia Delju. Give me a follow. I sometimes tease upcoming podcast episodes. I share a lot about my coaching programs, about events and uh, retreats that I'm hosting with some other awesome folks around town. And the last thing I want to add, I mentioned this in the beginning, but I did have the chance to work with Elise one-on-one when I started my business. And what was so cool and coincidental but magical about recording this episode with her was that the day we recorded was actually the day that I launched the inner work circle and she was such an integral part in helping me bring the vision for that group to life so thank you Elise for everything that you've done for me over the past couple years I am so grateful to you and the work you continue to put out into the world so thank you And if you are interested in learning more about the Inner Work Circle, I encourage you to check it out on my website. We are well into our first year with our August cohort, and we have already been seeing some incredible shifts happening with mindsets, with commitments, with accountability. These women have already accomplished so much even if things on the outside look the same internally such beautiful transformations are beginning to unfold and it really is just the beginning for them the waitlist is continuing to grow for the next cohort which will start in january of 2020 so if you want to add your name to that waitlist head over to the link in the show notes as well so i can reach out with some more information All right, that's it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will catch you on, oh wait, I forgot, email. If you want to reach out and say hello, you can email us at sincerelymepodcast at gmail.com. Okay, I think that's everything now. Oh, I always, there's always something I forget and I'll listen back to this in the car tomorrow when it's actually live and I'll be like, dang it, Talia, you forgot things. Oh well, anyways, here's to forgetting things. Have a great week and we'll catch you on next week's episode. Sincerely, me. Me.